Hello, everyone. I am Nathan P. Butler. I am, in terms of references for this episode of the update here, I am the creator, compiler, researcher, whatever you want to call me, of the Star Wars Timeline Gold, which is the current name for a project that began as the Star Wars Timeline 1.0, or the Star Wars Timeline Project, uh, really with its first public release back in 1997, and which had prior just versions of it that I made just for myself going back about a year prior to that. So it's a project that had its 20th anniversary back in October of 2017 that would theoretically have its 21st anniversary coming up this October, something that has taken up two decades of my life, something that as of a couple of years ago has taken up more than half of my life, and something that is now, in case you didn't see it in the previous update video, uh, or on Facebook or wherever, something that is now finally coming to an end. Uh, so in case you haven't heard, the 2018 edition of the Star Wars Timeline Gold will be its last edition. It will be the project's final edition. It'll be labeled that way. And that doesn't mean it's changing its name like when it went from you know 6.0 to 7.x to gold or anything like that. It means the project is coming to an end. How long it will remain available online, I don't know. Probably indefinitely. I'll probably just leave it sitting up there. I may even put old editions out there for those who are curious about what the old ones look like. Um, but the project will be ending. And there are basically three primary reasons for this. And I felt like because a lot of people who follow this channel are people who have followed my timeline for years, maybe even since the beginning, since the Discuss the Prequels AOL message board days where it was like, hey, tell me you want it and I'll email it to you, you know, back before I even had a website for the thing uh, on Angel Fire, the first one. God, that was awful. But then Zoom was worse, so whatever. Um, I feel as though since there are people who are in that crowd who still follow my stuff, um, I wanted to provide an actual explanation instead of just saying, okay, it's done. That's it. Or provide an explanation that was only in text, which feels very dry and impersonal um, and maybe doesn't get it across as well. I felt as though an explanation was needed. And so here we are with an explanation for why the Star Wars Timeline Project or Star Wars Timeline Gold is ending. Um, and I will note here before we get into any of these three reasons that part of why it's ending as opposed to continuing under new management, so to speak, um, is that, unfortunately, I don't really know anybody who I feel like is on the same wavelength to the point where, or has the time where, they'd be able to jump in and continue the project. Like, I think someone like a Luke Van Horn, a Robert Mullen, um, these are people out there who have a passion for this stuff. Eddie Vander Heiden, um, who have a passion for this stuff. And good ideas. We don't always see eye to eye on decisions about where we would put things or how we would approach even chronicling them, separating them into separate timelines in some cases and things like that, um, which I view as the only valid way to do it. Um, but also, I know that these are parents, professional guys, people who wouldn't really have the time to devote to keeping it going. And I don't want to try to force this on anybody. And so it's it seems better that it should end than that I should try to hand it off to somebody and have it fizzle out under new management, no matter how awesome somebody may be at probably picking up the reins. It just sort of feels like no one can know the crazy amount of work that it takes to keep that thing going until they've tried it. And by that time, it's under new management. And if it collapses, it's on someone else's watch. And I don't want to voice that responsibility or consequence on anyone. So it is going to end. Um, but there are three primary reasons why. One of which is awesome news that just happens to be a big life-affecting thing in terms of ripple effect. And two, a little more negative. So be warned, coming up here, it is quite possible that yours truly might get a little bit salty along the way. Wow. Who'd have thought? Me getting salty. He was salty before salt was a thing. Well, saltiness was a thing. I think salt was a thing. Gandhi's back there with his marchers like, mm -hmm, salt was already a thing, jackass. So, number one reason, and the thing that was finally the thing that sort of tipped the scales, is that we're having a baby. We are finally going to have, I keep saying it like that, we're having a baby. It's like my hands go, whoa, like this every single time. Um, but uh, after years of not being sure we'd ever be able to have a child and lots of health issues, um, we're finally having a baby. My wife is in her second trimester now. We're expecting baby... Uh, to arrive in September. Um, if it's a boy, which we 
think it is based on an early ultrasound, uh, but it was a fairly early ultrasound um, where the kid just could have flashed us, apparently. Um, we're thinking a boy, which would be Cade, if not a girl, which is Leia. Uh, she chose Leia, I chose Cade. We both basically agreed on it, so... My Star Wars name is a Star Wars name, but it's not as overtly so, and hers is just a straight-up Star Wars name. So, to some degree, she on that has more Greek, more geek cred than I do. Not Greek cred. Greek cred would be, like, currency from Greece, I would think. Yeah, it's going to be one of those videos, I think. But I recognize the fact that that is going to be a huge change in terms of lifestyle for us. And in my case... Um, I'm kind of in that unique position because of the job that I have in that I work mostly from home. I mean, this is my workspace. Like, here is the computer that I'm recording on for this that's usually in our bedroom. Here is my work computer set up right next to me. I work in my Star Wars office most of the time, except when I'm visiting schools, when I'm at meetings, when a student needs assistance and needs to be done uh, in person. I head out to a school to check in with them, that sort of thing. Uh, much of it is here. Uh, my wife works outside the home, so basically it's going to come down to me sort of being a much of the time working yet still stay at home dad, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, but I do recognize that that's going to sort of change the dynamics, even with me being here a lot, because heck, I'm here a lot now, and there's not a whole lot of time to work on the timeline. And as a result, something's got to give somewhere. And I look at all the projects that I do. And truly, the timeline is the one that, while it's the longest running, it's the most solitary feeling, and it's the one that has the least, I don't want to say positive um, reinforcement, because that's not exactly what I'm trying to say. I mean, it brings the least joy to me at this point, for multiple reasons, but part of it, I think, is just the psychology of how, you know, I do a video for YouTube, I put it out there, People are interacting very quickly, usually the same day that it's posted. We're able to have that conversation. Same thing with the podcast. Me and Mark or me and Michael get to have a conversation. We put out the episode. Then we're having conversations with the audience. Uh, great interactive stuff, whereas the timeline comes out once a year. And that means that you know we might have conversations about new stuff right as it comes out. But otherwise, the conversation is always kind of about the process. And... When I actually do the work on it, there's not like an immediate response. Like it may be, yes, I finished summarizing Legends of Luke Skywalker, where the biggest bonus of that, right, is the fact that I never have to read that freaking book ever again, because God, it was awful. Um, I will stand by that until the day they burn all the copies. Um, but it's like, hey, I'm done with Legends of Luke Skywalker. Hey, that's great, whatever. Um, but nobody gets to really see that summary or those events on the timeline until the next edition comes out. And by then, you know, that moment of the work has passed without really much positivity to go with the fact that it was done. Um, and it's a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of work. Um, reading a book, taking the notes on it, summarizing the thing, which usually takes hours on end at this point, um, particularly if it's a story that I really didn't care for or that I felt was a slog. If you think a book is a slog reading it, try summarizing the damn thing after the fact. It's even worse. Um, I would equate it to sort of the way that, you know, if you podcast, the recording itself is fine, but assume that in editing, if you're really meticulous about editing, you're looking at at least two to three times the same amount of time you spent recording it to edit it to make it sound good. Um, the summarizing time, the, the building off the notes time, the entering the information time is just ridiculously huge. And it's basically me sitting at this computer, facing a wall at my desk in our bedroom, kind of ensconced in a little cocoon while I'm working on it. It's a very solitary type of thing. And some people, you know, submit stuff from time to time. Luke Horn has been fantastic about sending in stuff about, you know, items I'd never seen before. Or they're so rare that I just, I don't know, they're rare or they're little kid stuff and I just haven't cared to get it. But he has or someone else has. He's sending me the info. Um, but beyond those types of interactions, it is extremely solitary. And that's not good for morale. It's a crap ton of work. It's, you know, some, most of the time it's over 100 plus new pages every year to this thing. And it's just daunting. It just gets to a point where it grinds on you. So I've always said if your fandom or something about your fandom is causing you more stress than it should, more stress than joy, um, if it feels more like work than fun, 
you're doing it wrong and it's time to reevaluate things. And of all the fan projects that I'm working on within the last little while, and even really before that, but especially in the last little while, of all of them, in balance, the timeline is the one that feels much more like work and an obligation than it does fun. And that meant that that was going to be the thing that should probably go. So in essence, part of it is prioritizing time in order to make the most of time with my son or daughter uh, and to keep the other projects alive that are a little more, what I think of as dynamic, you know, the conversations that are able to be had, um, the podcasting and everything, the stuff that really feels a little bit more dynamic than, hey, I'm sitting here writing a guide and then you're just going to read the guide. Although you would say that that kind of applies probably to a saga on home video too, but that's where my heavy passion is right now is the Star Wars home video stuff. So to me, that doesn't feel like work. It's still fun writing and creating um, for that, more so than it is for the timeline. And part of that comes down to the other two reasons, the ones that may be a little salty, the ones that I would think of as sort of the negative reasons. The positive, we're having a baby. That is awesome. It just necessitates some changes. That's what tipped it over the edge. But to say that I wasn't already considering it would be a lie. I've always said sort of in the last hell, the better part of the last decade, but I sort of consider the project on a year-by-year -year basis, a release-by-release -release basis. Will the next release even exist? It's kind of decided as I'm wrapping up a previous release and kind of looking ahead once that work is all fresh in my mind. And there are two things that caused me to get to a point where I was pretty much like, you know what, this, I'm not sure I want to do this anymore. And you could call this sort of the official side and the fan side. And the official side of it is something that I've talked about on other videos on podcasts before. And it basically comes down to an extreme frustration that I have, and many people who are into chronology have, with the way that the Star Wars product line, franchise, is being handled right now. Um, we were very frustrated in the past, as chronology people, um, when Lucas came in and would force a lot of retcons on the saga. But we recognize that Lucas got to do that because he is the creator of Star Wars. That is G canon. And in the Legends continuity, that superseded all. He had T canon on down. And it was extremely frustrating around the time of the Clone Wars, where the new Clone Wars cartoon series came in and just shattered everything that came before. And we were told, don't worry, there'll somehow be a way to fit this all together to make sense of it for the Legends continuity uh, once the Clone Wars TV series is over. We never actually got that information, that solution of how it actually is supposed to fit together, if at all, because by then, they'd moved on to starting to look at this new canon that is being produced. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of stuff in this new canon I'm really enjoying. Lost Stars, Bloodline, uh, Rebel Rising, uh, the character of Dr. Aphra. There are some great things going on in the new continuity, let alone the fact that I'm a big fan of Rebels, much prefer it over Clone Wars, and I've really liked the new films. Yes, even Last Jedi. Um, but there are problems that are happening that are becoming frustrating beyond what we see as the good. On the one hand, when you're chronicling things from the new continuity, whether it's books or comics, you pretty much know that most of the time what you're chronicling doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of Star Wars. Um, the books and the comics aren't where the big events are happening. They're happening on TV or they're happening in the movies. Uh, I'm still shocked and amazed that we ever got the Battle of Jakku in book form. I expected that would be, you know, maybe it's going to be a movie. Maybe it's a TV series or something. And maybe it still will be for all we know. But we actually got a major event in print. Otherwise, most of the stories feel like they're not really all that momentous. And many times... They're just not things that you would think that people would be interested in in the first place. Um, I enjoyed the individual stories, for instance, in the Canto Bite novel, or anthology, whatever you want to call it, for what they were. Uh, in particular, John Jackson Miller's story with the Lucky Three was really amusing to me. But that said, compare the anthologies we get now. Canto Bite, um, Tales from a Galaxy Far, Far Away, Aliens Volume 1. And what we're getting basically is sort of a, hey, there are these characters in the movie. We're going to tell you a story that happens to be about one of them. And with Canto Bite, we know it at least takes place during the film, even though there's no interaction with the events of the film. Not so much with Tales from a Galaxy Far, Far Away Aliens. 
Old anthologies, at least the three original anthologies during the Bantam days, were these are characters who you see in the movie, and we're going to show you why they're there, what they're doing, so that the scenes interweave with the movie. We're going to give you greater context, so you know what this character is doing and thinking when you spot them in the film in the background as... You know, Panda Baba's arm gets cut off, or as, you know, we don't serve their kind here, or look, sir, droids, all that, right? We are interweaving and branching out of it. Now that's not what it is. If this happens to be a character, maybe it takes place during the movie, we'll have a little side reference to maybe tell you it's during it, but nothing will happen during it. The can Having the entire Canto Bites set of four stories go by, and not a single one of them referencing the Fathers tearing the place apart, blows my mind. Because that's not the way the anthologies were meant to be. But that seems to be fairly par for the course for the new continuity. Tell us a story that barely means anything to sell us a book to tie into the next thing. Um, never mind the labeling of the road to or the journey to Star Wars, the whatever, whatever the next movie happens to be, that usually doesn't feel so much like a journey towards it as, hey, it's something that vaguely references a character or situation from it. They're very loose with the storytelling now. They are really good at tying in links between the movies and the show, uh, like Rebels, or tying in links between the movies or Rebels and a video game. When it comes to the books and comics, they don't really seem to care all that much about making those things actually reference each other, connect to each other, have an impact on everything else. It doesn't feel like everything is of the same level of canon as we were being told. It feels more like... It may all be just as valid, but we know that there's stuff that's way more important than others. It is the George Orwell, it is the communist, um, uh, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Well, all Star Wars stories are now equal, but some are more equal than others. The films and the TV series that matter compared to everything else that most of the time doesn't. Which is not fun to summarize when you're going through and you're like, I didn't feel like this mattered in the first place. Why does this need a freaking summary? Well, because that's just what I do. Summaries and events. If it's not on there, it'll be something missing. It needs to be on there. But that's not fun. Um, I think to the um, the books, right? Um, for someone who is into chronology, the books are headaches now. Even no matter how good the story is. Like, I really enjoyed the Thrawn novel. I really enjoyed the Tarkin novel. But there is a significant difference between the two. The Tarkin novel bothered tell us when the hell it took place. And to give us time references to figure out when everything that was happening in the book in flashbacks took place in relation to it. Then you have books like Bloodline that pins it down, and Lost Stars that pins it down, Rebel Rising that pins it down. But for every one of those that you get, and usually it's Disney Lucasfilm Press for the young adults that's doing a hell of a lot better job than the adult novels are from Del Rey, um, usually the Del Rey novels take a more lax approach, like with Thrawn, which I liked, or like with Phasma, which I thought was hot garbage. Uh, a dumpster fire, so to speak, in the middle of the desert with scorpions and crap. Um, and that is that they will give you a story with a lot of time jumps in it. And the time jumps and the time references will be very specific. You're like, yes, I'm a chronology person. I love the fact that here it says this was 10 years ago, that was 5 years ago, and this character is 17 years old and 25 years old. I can place these. Awesome. All i got to do is figure out when the story takes place and I can reference all of these. And then they don't bother to tell you when the fucking story takes place. Whoops, excuse me. They don't bother to tell you when the story takes place at all. We have no idea when the Phasma novel takes place. We only know a vague sense of when it is between, thanks to looking at the timeline in the front of the book that just lists the books in order with no actual dates to go with any of them. The closest we have to an actual date for Phasma is to figure out, well, there's this character who was of this age this many years ago, so here's what their age would be now. And at one point, they do reference that they're about the same age as Phasma and Hux. So if we assume that actually means it is the same age, all we need to do is figure out their age to figure out when it took place because we have an age at a certain point. And, oh, wait, there was this random tweet by Pablo, who is awesome for the most part, by the way. Love Pablo. Um, and Leland, for that matter. Um... And Pablo puts out a tweet that basically, you know, gives an age for, I believe it was Hux. Well, Hux is the same age as Phasma, who's the same age as this character, and we have ages for this character, we can sort of place the novel. Why in the hell do we have to go through that to come up with a placement for a novel when really, more than likely, the author didn't think it through that much? The author probably never thought it through as to pinning it down that specifically. So we're out here doing all this detective work, but it's kind of like the... Uh, the thing where it's like, so, when in this novel, 
you have a character who refers to an African American by a racial epithet. Were you talking about the symbolism of all of American society and the efficacy of the alt-right versus Black Lives Matter in the 2016 election, etc., etc.? What was your symbolism? And the person turns to you and says, I just had him use that word because the character's an asshole, and I wanted to make sure the reader knew on site, this is an asshole. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes a placement that's not specific and has no way of actually pinning it down to be specific without doing Sherlock Holmes level freaking detective work is just a story that hasn't been pinned down. It's wishy-washy. It's not concrete. It's, well, we're not going to pin it down because we might try to tell a story on either side of it at some point and have to move that story for that placement. It's convenient for that, but I tell you, it makes for bad continuity. You're going to wind up biting yourself in the ass, and pretty soon we're going to have a continuity for much of the saga that's probably going to be just as screwed up and difficult to figure out as the era between A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back was in Legends, with all these different people producing stories that are meant to be in the same time period without any effort to truly coordinate them chronologically. Story point? Theme? Maybe. Characters? Maybe. Chronologically? No. How is that solid oversight? Uh, the thought was... When the story group came around, that we thought that this was the group that had the grand plan for things. They were going to have this grand arc, and all of Star Wars would mean something, because they would be the architects. No more Lucas on high coming in and smashing through things by doing things that contradicted everything else. It would all work. You know, to borrow a phrase from uh, the Marvel stuff, uh, right? What is it? You know, it all matters, or whatever. It's all tied together, or whatever. Um, that sort of thing, right? It all is going to mean something. But it doesn't feel like there's an overarching plan. I mean, we learned that with the films. I mean, not that the films were bad. I've enjoyed the most recent films. But when they're telling us, well, we just kind of let the writer do whatever the hell they want, and we'll figure it out after the fact. That's not a grand plan. Um, I had great hope for the story group as the grand planners of Star Wars, and maybe I was just misled or confused about what they were supposed to be. Um... But my faith in the idea of a broad, grand plan for Star Wars is gone. There is no way in hell there is a roadmap for this saga at this point. Um, so we looked at the books. Spin it around to the comics. Right, so the books, they're not pinning it down. Um, Phasma didn't get pinned down. Thrawn, great use of the dates to try to show Thrawn's career as it grows. And we know when the end of it takes place, right before the season of Rebels where he first appears, but none of the stuff before it with all kinds of intricate dating can be placed intricately or exactly because we don't know the time gap in between and they're not willing to pin it down, and so on and so on. So Thrawn's kind of the same thing. Nebulous dating. Then you get to the comics. And the Marvel way versus the Star Wars way. Uh, under Jordan White, uh, it seems as though they were doing the Marvel way based on an interview he gave recently rather than the Star Wars way. And the Marvel way is have a whole bunch of comics being produced at the same time, and have sort of a vague present of your comics, and they're all kind of happening around then, and the characters just kind of go back and forth, and there you go. That's why you have stories from Marvel where a character can be in one place doing something completely different of where their story is in a whole different series, and yet somehow it's supposed to be the same character, same universe, approximately the same time, but it makes no damn sense whatsoever. Star Wars hasn't gotten that bad, but under White's leadership at Marvel, we were getting pretty damn close to that. Because it was stuff like, hey, when's that Han Solo miniseries take place? <sighs> I don't know, sometime between A New Hope and Empire. Um, probably vaguely around when it was published compared to these other stories, because they're sort of like a moving present kind of thing. Hey, when's the Han Solo, or excuse me, when's the uh, Lando miniseries take place? Sometime between A New Hope and Empire. Where's the specificity? That's a three-year freaking gap. If anybody's going to use Lando in any other story in that time period, they're not going to know what where he is in his life relative to that comic series unless somebody pins the damn thing down. But that's the Marvel way. Not previously the Star Wars way. Um, Dark Horse had that stuff down pat. Marvel is just like, Yay! Isn't this fun with Star Wars? And not actually, again, having a plan, it seems like, to what they're doing. I think it is changing. White is out of the Star Wars line. Jason Aaron, who seemed to play a little bit faster and looser than Kieran Gillen, if I'm saying his name right, or Charles Sewell did, uh, is not writing the main Star Wars series anymore. Uh, I think the writers they've got on it now 
care more about that stuff to an extent, and maybe we'll see it get better. I certainly like the new Darth Vader series more than the previous one. Um, I think that things are going in the right direction in some respects, but from a chronological standpoint, no, it's still not. Um, a one week, or excuse me, an eight day stretch can tell us just how nobody's minding the ship. It's two hands who don't know what they're doing. One of them is over here patting itself on the back like, look how great a job we're doing. And the other one is wearing brass knuckles and constantly punching himself in the nuts. So, in an eight-day period, we had the release of the newest issue as of the time I'm recording this of Poe Dameron, and the week prior to that, we had the release of Darth Vader, Dark Lord of the Sith. Not that you would know it's called Dark Lord of the Sith because it's nowhere on the title, but it's Darth Vader... Lord of the Sith, the new Darth Vader series, number 13. Both released in the span of eight days. The Darth Vader one came first, but it's the craziest, so we'll hold that. Let's jump to uh, the Poe Dameron one first. Poe Dameron issue finally brings together characters that seem like they were their relationship was falling apart. Snap Wexley and Kare Kun. Characters that we've grown to like throughout that series who have built into a relationship, and then circumstances started to push them apart, and now circumstances have finally brought them back together again, and they're finally getting married. And we see a brief one-panel shot of their marriage in the newest issue of Poe Dameron. Surely that's not a big deal. Well, no. Instead, we got sort of a courtship Le uh, Princess Leia, prophets of the dark side kind of thing going on again, where... Now we're back to this whole idea of two weddings completely clashing in how and when they're taking place. Because back in the god-awful Escape from Vondren, uh, no, it's, not to say god-awful, a, a book with a bunch of god-awful pieces, but a book that as a whole was all right. Put it that way. In the book Escape from, Bo uh, of Escape from Vondren by uh, Ben Acker and Ben Blacker, you have this instance where one of the characters is reminiscing with another character while they're kind of worried about their friends, about the wedding of Kare and Snap, and how in order to keep this from being something that uh, disrupted things at the Dakar base for the Resistance, it was sort of held in secret. It was officiated by Poe, so that he could, you know, marry them without dealing with any of the Alliance or the uh, Resistance High Command getting involved or anything. But you see, the food was all handled by the kids of J-Squad, and they screwed up in one of the foods that they gave, and it gave everyone flatulence. So all throughout the wedding, they were farting like crazy. And it's this great little laughter-producing part, albeit childish as hell, makes Jar Jar look sophisticated, um, in that book for these reminiscing characters. Um, and one of the things that's noted was that Audi Muva, uh, the mechanic that we see in uh, the Poe Dameron comics who winds up betraying them to save his family and then winds up going uh, and kind of finally dying a hero's death and everything, that Audi was there at the wedding. So we have the incredible farting wedding with Audi present, presided over by Poe. Then we get the newest issue of Poe Dameron. Audi is dead and has been for a while. Okay? And there's no mention of the farting, but it's only one shot of the wedding. And the response has been, well, I don't know if there has to actually have been two weddings, like an unofficial and official one or anything. I just figured the kids are having trouble telling the Abendados apart, so they got Audi confused with uh, Eloasti, and that's just because they just didn't know them very well. So it was actually Eloasti that was there, not Audi. Great! Could the kids also not tell the difference between Poe and Leia? Because they said Poe gave the wedding and Leia wasn't there because the Resistance High Command weren't part of it. They were kept out of it, and it's Leia that's officiating in the comic. Something as specific as a wedding of two characters, how do you not coordinate that? How do you not make sure it makes sense? How does that not go through some process to say, hey, this was mentioned somewhere else. Did somebody do something that I'm about to contradict? Isn't that what the whole point of having a unified continuity is for? A shared universe where facts are facts and you're not getting a bunch of contradictory crap happening? But no. We now have the contradictory wedding. Though, even though it's only one panel, I much prefer the way that it was pulled off in the comic rather than the book, because at least it's no longer the incredible farting wedding. Incredible? Yeah, might as well say incredible instead of incredible if we're talking about kids and farting, because that sounds just as childish as the concept itself. Uh, unintentional reference there. Um, but a week before that, we had Darth Vader number 13. And Darth Vader number 13 was a big deal 
for that series um, because it jumped ahead in time by three years. We went from the founding of the Inquisitors and Vader in charge of them shortly after Revenge of the Sith, jumped three years into the future, and now the Empire is in a different place. Vader is in a different place. Palpatine's in a different place. The galaxy is in a different place. New technologies, uh, new practices, new ways of doing things, a different reputation. It was a big deal to make that time jump, and the author of the, the comic series talked about that in detail, or brief detail, um, on his own website about how it's a new direction, a new time jump. It was great to be able to do this time jump and see how things have changed, etc., etc. It's the author's intention that there was a time jump. Three years. It's referenced in the opening crawl. It's referenced by Palpatine. Except, in the story, we see the sixth brother. Uh, I believe it's the sixth brother. We, we see the Inquisitor that Ahsoka should already have killed by that point in the Ahsoka novel. And the response to this is, oh, uh... Actually, we're, we're pretty sure, and this is the story group response, we're actually not sure that it's actually supposed to have done that. Uh, we think that actually that is the sixth brother, but um, the three-year time gap was a, it was an error. It was like a typo. It was a mistake. So it's actually meant to be just in that first year uh, after Revenge of the Sith. Really? Because nobody told Sewell, nobody told the writer of this thing that that's the case. That was the entire intent. That's a huge part of the context of the issue that he builds in that story. You're really going to change that over someone who could just be another character named the same? Because, I mean, Sixth Brother, Fifth Brother, and all that kind of stuff, those are titles, right? That's not like they're named like Bob. You're going to change it for that? And yes, yes, they did. Future printings will have it changed. They changed it to say, some time has passed. And Palpatine's saying, you know, in the year instead of three years since I took power. And that has now been changed. And even the uh, digital version of it has been changed. In fact, the digital version has already been changed. So if you update your copy or get the issue now, it's going to have the new text, not the old three years text. And Sewell's got to be sitting back there thinking, what did you do to my story? If you didn't want me to, to make it three years as a time jump, could somebody not have told us this during the creative process at some point? Maybe while it was going through the various editors, could somebody at Lucasfilm who's approving this shit have not said something at the time? No. No. We're just going to retcon it and completely change the author's original intent so that a hell of a lot of things change in the Empire in a matter of months, not a matter of three years. Fine. But there was already an issue in the issue, so to speak, because we have Tarkin in it being referred to as Grand Moth. Even if the time jump was only three years, that's still two years too early for him to be a Grand Moff, as we learned in the whole novel about the character Tarkin, which is set five years after Revenge of the Sith. So that had to be changed anyway, and it got changed in the reprint to Governor instead of Grand Moff. But these types of retcons and changes and these clashing ideas would not be happening if they were really paying attention and coordinating this stuff the way that we were led to believe they were going to. A time jump of three years is a big deal for a comic series. How did somebody not approve that? And if they did, why not stick to your guns and give us an explanation for the whole Six Brother thing or whatever, instead of just changing the entire concept of that arc of the series and where it is chronologically? It's asinine. But the bearing that this has on the future of the Star Wars timeline gold is that there have been times I've been frustrated and I said, you know, if they don't care about this, why should I? You know, if they're not going to work it out, why should I be here working it out? I'm not, it's not my job to work it out. Why am I having to do all this detective work on something that they couldn't be bothered to do or couldn't be bothered to share, you know, if they actually have an answer to it? Um, why am I putting in all this time and effort when it seems as though sometimes I'm putting in more effort than they are? And I was always able to kind of roll it back and say, just, this is my frustration talking. This is just... Me, in this particular instance, on this particular book, this particular story, having an issue with it, if I calm down, I can keep it going, everything is fine, have faith. Everything will be okay, it's not as bad as it seems. But unfortunately, that seems to have been borne out recently more often than not with the approach being taken to the books and comics. And I have to ask... When looking at the future of the timeline in relation to the products that I'm chronicling these days, if they don't give a shit, why should I? Why should any of us who care about chronology give a shit if those who are actually supposed to be coordinating it do not seem to? That finally reached the boiling point with Darth Vader and Poe Dameron. 
and it pushed things towards that point of, if there was a time to be done, it's time to be done. Because I'm not going to constantly keep beating my head against the wall trying to work on a project to sort out their messes because they can't do their jobs efficiently. And I know this may be something that's going to cause such an, such a, uh, an annoyance at some point that if I ever was on the edge of someone being able to say, hey, you know, we should bring him in to write again, that, that, that's gone. Okay, fine. Truth to power, when I got a chance to write for Tales, the first thing I asked Jeremy Barlow was, would it compromise my ability to do the podcast I was doing at the time, being the voice of the loyal opposition, someone who loves Star Wars so much, they're willing to be the voice of negativity to say, this is a problem, it needs to be fixed for the betterment of what I love. To be someone who sits back like the person who comes in to the drug addict and says, I love you, I'm taking you to rehab, even if they're cussing you out, throwing things at you, and trying to kill you as you're dragging them to a place that hopefully will save their life. I love this stuff. Chronology is my thing, too. I love this stuff. I don't think they do. And I don't think that they ever... I don't think it's that they ever loved it more than they loved the storytelling. But I think they loved the storytelling and understood that chronology was an integral part of keeping it all straight. And in part of what we loved about the Legends continuity was that we had that roadmap of how it all fit together. And that is gone. Or it is fading. And some people out there are still holding the torch. Um, Christy Golden. Claudia Gray. Um, there are people out there still holding the torch of Chronology matters because they will actually make sure that their stories are pinned down and make sense chronologically. But Marvel? No. And some of the authors are being pulled into that same thing now. And something's got to give. And I'm off the train at this point. Um... So that's one of the negatives. See, I told you it'd be very salty. Um, I apologize for the language, but I'm not sure how to communicate it otherwise. Because I am so pissed off that if I try to say stuff instead of shit, I'm not sure that I'm getting across my actual frustration with it. The second thing, though, that I would say is negative is internet fandom has become ridiculously toxic. I've talked about this a lot on the programs. Um how basically we're at the point where people want to tear each other down, people aren't wanting to listen to logical argument, they don't want to be intellectually honest, they're falling into the same kind of crappy uh, Twitter-verse type of mentality that we get in much of society around us, and in politics in particular, around us. Um, I used to think Star Wars fans were better than that. Our community will get through it better than the society around us. I think now that there are pockets of fandom that are better than that, I think fandom in general has a cancer at this point. And that cancer is not a specific group of people, but this intolerance towards other fans. Whether it is that I don't like your opinion, or you like a movie I don't like so I hate you, or how dare you like this. Um, again, I have gotten threats of physical harm because I have dared to say that I enjoy both Legends and Canon, and guess what? It's not a crime to enjoy both. You as a fan can choose what you like. And I've gotten physically threatened over this. But it's just, it's, it's, um, it's, it, it's bizarre to me, this idea of how toxic fandom has become. And maybe it's always been there, but I don't think so. I don't remember, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago when I started the timeline. I mean, this was not the way that fandom was. The social media type of, of mindset has grown to the point where now it's all about the toxicity, and if you try to be the voice of reason, or lack thereof, as I say on the blog, usually you get blasted for that. Um, I did an experiment. said I was going to. I did an experiment. I posted, posted something that basically just had the title, um, uh, The Last Jedi uh, Plot Points. The actual text of it um, was... The, the words Ray, Finn, Poe, and the rest of it was basically blah, 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 and I did add one little line of uh, never going to give you up in the middle of it, right? Posted it. All kinds of people immediately, oh, F Disney, screw Disney, last year I can suck my... There was no content. 
They had nothing to respond to like that except the title of the post that happened to use the phrase The Last Jedi. There is such a thing, I, I believe, in psychology as actual triggers. Now, somebody really can be triggered by a traumatic event being brought back to memory because of something they see. But we've gone way beyond that when it comes to this idea of, knee, of, of conflating knee-jerk reactions and triggering. Um, you're not being triggered if somebody says The Last Jedi. You're just having a knee-jerk reaction and being a dick. That's different if you can't handle someone who happens to like a movie you dislike. Or the other way around. I've seen people who uh, basically uh, disliked Last Jedi who are being attacked by those who liked it because they dared not to like something that they liked. That is not any better than the converse of that. If you are saying that my personal opinion must be held by all, and if not, you are a bad fan, or to hell with you, you are an asshole. But part and parcel with this, because, I mean, this has been going on for a while, and I was still doing the timeline. Part and parcel with this is that things have changed, even in the community around the Star Wars Timeline Gold's Facebook page. Um, I've been very happy that for years that's been a place for rational discussion. And as I pointed out before, the only real rules were, essentially, to make sure that you are not being, uh, and, uh, the obvious stuff, like don't post pornography and stuff like that, obviously. Um, but when it came to the discussion, I'm not going to ban you for having an opinion I disagree with. I'm not going to ban, I'm not going to ban you for disagreeing with someone else or anything like that, but no personal attacks. And please be civil to one another and don't use a bunch of profanity. Um, and be intellectually honest. Don't come in and purposely try to spread false information. Being wrong is fine. That can be corrected. But once you know what the actual truth is and it has been explained and you're still out there saying stuff like, you know, um, you know, George Lucas's Star Wars films uh, and the Legends books were always equal in canon status, which was not the case. You know, the GTC and so on existed. Um, then I am going to say we're done. Right. But it was fairly rare for someone to be banned or even really reprimanded because it took being really intellectually dishonest, attacking someone else, um, just kind of being a complete douche. And the fact that the thing's, you know, set up to be able to handle profanity as its own filter, I mean, I don't even have to really police that or anything. But I try to stick to this idea that if I really appreciate intellectual honesty and discussion, we got to be able to have the discussions even if we don't agree with each other as long as we're being civil to one another. And it's the civility that started to go out the window. I try to post something like, so I just finished up this story, and I, this is what I think is happening chronologically. It's not pinned down, but I think this is what my reasoning is going to be, just to kind of let people know the thought process, because that's what people liked about the page. It's not just, hey, I just summarized this, but the talk about the process of it. You know, like, Phasma, here's how I figured out this, this, and this, and I think the only way you can pin down the book is this thing with the character ages, which isn't ideal, but... At least it lets me pin it down and actually enter it onto the document. And granted, because a lot of that working out of the process is when things aren't working or they're contradictory or the information's not there, that it can come across as frustrating. Uh, a lot of times when I make a post like, here we go, Poe Dameron seems to be clashing with Escape from Vodrin, not really sure what we do here, or something like that. Um, it would at least be a conversation where we'd be able to talk about that issue, potential solutions, and that sort of thing. We could keep it on that. Instead, now, nothing on something like that, or maybe, you know, say, talking about Dark Vader number 13 and its issues that I just mentioned in very vehement tones, nothing even calm said about Dark Vader number 13 can be said without half of the comments below it basically being, F Disney, Disney can kiss it, but... We never should have done... Oh, no, no, legends can go to hell. Oh, oh, oh you're an asshole because you don't like what I like. Oh, I'm triggered. When even the timelines page on those things that is a place that I've seen and has been for so long, sort of a bastion of intellectually honest discussion, can turn into that shit. And these are mostly people I've never heard of who generally don't ever post on the page. But there are people who have now are now posting, who've apparently been sitting in the background somewhere, doing this kind of stuff. The toxicity, for the most part, hadn't hit the timelines page. For the most part, it had been able to wear a nice environmental suit, and every once in a while, you know, some of the dampness of the air around would get inside the seals, but none of the poison would. 
And now the poison is getting through. The environmental seal has a nice big rip in its side. And it makes that type of discussion not fun anymore. I will no longer be posting really anything on the timelines page other than links to the videos and stuff as they go up for now. And, hey, I just finished this summary. Hey, I just finished this summary. You want a discussion on stuff that is actually relevant to chronology? You shouldn't have been dickwads about it. I'm done. I'm done. So you take that plus the other, pushing me towards this boiling point of something's got to give. And thankfully, instead of it being something really bad happening, tipping it over. It turned out to be something really good happening that finally tipped the scale to say, you've got to step away from this. You're going to have a child. You cannot let this consume you, and you won't have time for it anyway. got to back away, or you're not going to be able to enjoy it anymore. You're not going to be any good to anyone, especially as a father trying to introduce Star Wars to his child someday. You're not going to be any good to anyone if the toxicity gets into you. The only solution to that is to say goodbye to the timeline. Thankfully, again, it comes at the time when it's for a good reason with some bad things that pushed it in that direction rather than all being negative. Um, but when it comes to the frustrations of trying to deal with all of this lack of cohesion that we're seeing chronologically within the Star Wars publications at this point, when it comes to dealing with the toxicity in fandom at this point, at least as it relates to uh, publishing chronology and the whole Disney versus pre-Disney stuff goes, I kind of feel like we're in the war games scenario. The only way to win is not to play. So my board is being put up. The last edition of the Star Wars Timeline Gold will come out in 2018. I don't know how much it'll have on it, how caught up it will be. I will try to keep it caught up on the newest novels and comics, uh, episodes of Rebels that I still haven't summarized, uh, make sure it has Solo on it and such. But when it's done, it's done. When I release it, that's just where the work stops. And the timeline project itself comes to an end. It's a hell of a legacy. It's open doors for me to be able to write for Star Wars, write about Star Wars. It probably is a big part of why the audience existed in the first place for Chrono Radio that is, has spun off into audiences for things like Cloud City Casino, now that I'm on it. Um, uh, Star Wars Beyond the Films, once Mark and I launched that, EU Review before that, maybe the YouTube channel also. I'm hoping that the other stuff that I do is still worthwhile enough that people will still partake of it. But the timeline is done. Partly because I'm entering a new phase of my life that I'm incredibly excited about, and I know there are changes that coming. You know, like the song says, times they are a-changing. Um, but partly... Because it's just not fun anymore. And I don't think that's the fault of the project. I don't think it's the fault of the project's longtime supporters, who in some cases have been around for 20 years now. There's things beyond our control that are making the environment one in which it's hard to breathe if you're a Star Wars chronology fan. If you're someone who cares about Star Wars and the inner workings of its chronological aspects. And I'm getting out before I suffocate. So, I felt you deserved that explanation. I apologize. I got a little over salty, but this may be the last time you hear me talk about that a whole lot, beyond maybe getting a specific question in a Q&A or something, because it slowly becomes less of apropos of a discussion when I'm not actually working on the timeline and dealing with those issues constantly um, anymore. Hopefully that means a lighter spirit, a happier Nate, and um, you know, maybe somebody else will pick up the ball and create something similar someday. Um, but it just won't be me. So thank you all for your support over the years for the Star Wars Timeline Gold and your continued support for the other projects. I hope this doesn't strike too much of a blow um, to my fellow fans to know that that resource will not be there anymore. Hopefully, if anybody from officialdom is hearing this, again, remember, I love Star Wars. I don't love what's happening with it right now. And the people behind the scenes can change things for the positive in one sense. Fellow fans have the potential to change things on the other side of things. But at this point, I'm not sure I hold out hope for either. 
which makes me very glad that there are the Star Wars gaming communities, home video communities, um, and the many amazing people I've met over the years while working on the timeline of the podcast and everything, um, with whom I can still sit down and have a fun Star Wars conversation with without having to worry that they'll go into a spittle-flecked rage when they disagree with a minute opinion. May the Force be with you all. If you've taken this as it's intended, I imagine you're one of the good ones, and I appreciate you being around.